How did life begin? This is a fascinating question, uh, which many have addressed from many different uh, angles. Um, many geneticists find themselves looking into uh, various aspects of this question or that uh, topics related to this come up uh, with the analysis of genes and genomes. And so I'd like to then put um, a number of thoughts together on how life uh, uh, began, uh, what early life was like, and how this uh, affects the genetic analysis. Um, so first off, uh, for the longest time, the idea of spontaneous generation was held. Uh, so the idea that life could spring from non-life continually, so that there could be, uh, you know, tadpoles springing from mud, uh, that flies could come from uh, garbage, uh, that uh, if you simply left, you know, mud or uh, uh, other uh, items uh, exposed to air, that you would get uh, mice and, you know, all sorts of uh, little animals. And so this, you know, was a major belief by prominent uh, thinkers for thousands of years, this idea of spontaneous generation. Um, well, now we hold that cells only come from other cells, that life only comes from life. Well, that then obviously begs a question. So if each living thing had a parent, which was a living thing, uh, where then do uh, the first living things uh, originate uh, from? Okay. Well, uh, the answer is, you know, put it bluntly, we don't know. But um, we certainly do know a lot which seems to be uh, relevant. And not only is it an interesting question to, uh, to ponder, but asking about life and early life has actually led to brilliant discoveries, Nobel Prize winning work, which has changed the way that we view human cells. Um, so our modern understanding of you know, cells, uh, our, you know, modern applications in biotechnology and, you know, cancer research, uh, they stem from uh, things learned by asking these questions. And so while we can't say we absolutely know this, given that we don't have time machines, nor do we have, you know, the actual first living things that we can compare, nevertheless, um, by asking questions, by performing studies, the things which are learned um, then increase our understanding of the natural world, which then has lots of, of uh, implications. So these are worthwhile questions to ask. Since I want to focus on the genetics of it, I'll kind of skip some of the earlier um, aspects. So for example, uh, it is known that all of the building blocks of living things can be generated in the absence of life. It was once thought that things like sugars, proteins, lipids, nucleic acids, etc., that these were biomolecules unique to living things. For a while, it was even thought that they had some mystical vital force that could only be present uh, in uh, living things. But we now know that the non-living world um, if you simply have, you know, basic molecules like carbon dioxide, methane, ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, et cetera, you add a little bit of energy and you get sugars, the same sugars that you find in living things. You get all of the amino acids, you get all of the nitrogenous um, bases, uh, et cetera. So every single biomolecule found in living things can actually be generated in the absence of living things. And a lot of those who are uh, then looking into aspects of this, you know, we're bridging, say, genetics and biochemistry. So for example, where might nucleic acids have come from, DNA bases, RNA bases? Well, if you take water, which is the most abundant molecule with three atoms in the universe, and hydrogen cyanide, which is the most abundant organic molecule with carbon and hydrogen in the universe, um, then you can combine them um, to get what's called a formamide. Uh, and from formamide, you can then construct other uh, molecules in the absence of life. Um, but this would include uh, all of the bases of DNA and uh, RNA. And so some geneticists, you know, take this more molecular aspect, where might uracil have come from, where might, you know, thymine um, have come from, uh, et cetera, uh, doing uh, studies uh, like uh, these.
Sorry, I'm not quite sure why I can't advance. There we go. Um, and so all of the building blocks of life uh, can arise without life. And in the absence of life, you can get sugars forming chains, amino acids forming chains, nucleotides forming uh, chains in the absence of life. There are certain conditions uh, which help this, uh, the presence of clays, drying conditions. Um, even, uh, you know, a wonderful you know, paper I read was saying that, you know, uh, in the early earth, the moon would have been much closer. So tides would have been crazy. So that from high tide to low tide, that there would have been, you know, this huge area which was covered by water, and then the water would have retracted, the areas would have, have dried. Um, but this then would have, say, simulated some of the conditions in which molecules can then be replicated. So aqueous solutions would have come in, molecules would have uh, reacted, encouraging uh, the formation of these chains as they dried, then they would have been bathed in aqueous solution again, and the, the thing would have uh, repeated. And so in the early Earth, um, it is thought that the oceans uh, would have accumulated all of these biomolecules, which would not have broken down. Today, biomolecules degrade because of the presence of oxygen or because of bacteria which degrade them. But the early Earth would have had neither of, uh, of those. And so you would have had this primordial soup of um, of organic uh, molecules, which would have lasted for thousands and thousands of years. Um, and in this mix, you can take, you know, say lipids and proteins, mix them with water, and you get these spheres, microspheres, you might want to call them coacervates and other things. Well, they can grow, kind of. And, and by grow, I don't mean they're not alive, they're just bubbles, essentially. But they can accumulate more molecules and grow and then split into two. And then those can split. Now, this might look like cellular division. It's not. These aren't alive. But nevertheless, in the absence of life, these things are swelling. Um, other organic molecules can end up on the inside, um, given you know, the interactions with membranes um, and the reactions of you know, hydrophilic and hydrophobic molecules. If any of these molecules, like RNA molecules, um, could perform a chemical reaction, you would then have essentially bubbles in which chemical reactions were uh, occurring. All of this could happen in the absence of life. Now, how do you bridge you know, these microspheres with maybe a few chemical reactions uh, in them to the precursor of living things? Well, that's the big question. That's the big gap where this is still not fully understood. It is thought that RNA plays a key role. It is proposed that while modern cells use DNA to encode RNA, which then encodes protein, but that would have been far too complex for the very first cells. But RNA could have served as all three of those, as a genome, as an intermediary, and as the thing which does the doing in the cells, you know, uh, performing various tasks the way that proteins do today. Uh, now, this has led to you know, a huge amount of research into RNA, and we've learned so much, especially about how much RNA is doing in our cells. You know, when I was in school, once again, DNA makes RNA, which makes protein, protein runs the cell. That was the dogma. Um, and since then, in large part, stemming from origin of life studies, asking, you know, might RNA be more complex? We've realized how much RNA is doing in our cells that we didn't know of. Right, so it turns out RNA is far more involved than what we thought, and it was, you know, once again asking these questions, um, uh, which uh, got uh, to uh, that point. Um, now, a couple of things we've learned about RNA is that in addition to the basic four RNA nucleotides, there's lots of additional ones you can modify RNA uh, nucleotides, and so there's more than just four. And when you look now at the breadth of potential RNA uh, nucleotides, it's clear that with all of these extra functional groups, um, RNA approaches protein in the complexity of functional groups, uh, which would then allow it to then perform uh, various uh, tasks uh, with, uh, within uh, cells. Another aspect uh, which we now uh, appreciate is just um, how complex the three-dimensional structure 
of RNA molecules uh, uh, can, uh, can be. Um, and so um, at some point, uh, we think that uh, the uh, complexity of RNA, including RNA molecules, which can catalyze chemical reactions, once again, the discovery of this was Nobel Prize winning work. And we now appreciate that even in our cells, RNA molecules can be ribozymes. So not all chemical reactions are catalyzed by protein enzymes. Some are catalyzed by ribozymes, RNA molecules. This would include the splicing of DNA and the editing of uh, genomes. This would include uh, what happens in a ribosome where amino acids are joined to make uh, proteins. So some not only do can chemical reactions be performed by ribosome, uh, uh, by RNA, but also some of the most important uh, chemical reactions in cells, the editing of the genome and the synthesis of proteins is actually catalyzed by uh, RNA. So at some point then there were cells. And we think that while in the RNA world that uh, RNA served as the genome and the doer of cells, at some point then the transition to using DNA, which is a more stable code uh, for the genetic message, and the use more of more protein um, to do stuff in the cell that this, uh, this transition uh, occurred and that the cells which then did this, used DNA for their genome, um, and then used uh, proteins uh, to perform uh, work uh, with inside the cell, we think this was the last universal common ancestor. And that from these um, cells which had this primitive genetic code, uh, that uh, all uh, life that we know of today has evolved so that there was, you know, these preliminary, you know, stages of, you know, cell precursors. But once you got to this, you know, last universal common ancestor, which some call LUCA, uh, that uh, this is the ancestor of the life uh, that we see today. So even though there are differences in DNA replication of transcription of translation, when you compare, say, eukaryotes like humans to um, bacteria, there are similarities in, say, you know, how they transcribe their genes or replicate their DNA. And so while there are differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, there are also similarities. So it is thought that LUCA had some of the basic mechanics of DNA replication, transcription, and translation. Um, uh, not all of these, these processes weren't perfected, which is why, say, eubacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes would then um, complete these in uh, different uh, ways, uh, but that nevertheless, you know, the rudiments uh, were there. One big uh, example of this would not only be, you know, similar uh, homologous genes, but also the universal genetic code. So even if you're going to use triplet codons to signify amino acids, there's no reason that all living things would share the same codon um, uh, meanings uh, unless uh, all living things were descended from ancestors which then had this and they've inherited it from uh, those ancestors. So the DNA code is what we call universal. So you, 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 that um, would be translated as phenylalanine, whether you're a human cell, a plant cell, a fungal cell, an amoeba, or a bacterium. CCU gets translated as proline, CAU as histidine in all groups of, uh, of organisms. So this is a genetic, I'm sorry, this is a universal code. Now, there are a couple of exceptions among bacteria and protists where what most groups interpret as a stop codon, there might actually be uh, a meaning uh, to the, uh, the code on there. But with, once again, these rare exceptions, the DNA code seems uh, to be uh, universal. Um, and so uh, the original cells had a genetic code and DNA replication mechanisms, uh, which have been inherited in all uh, living things that descended from them. Uh, the same for the mechanics of transcription. And then the same for translation. Once again, there are differences between, say, the ribosomes of 
you know, bacteria and eukaryotes, but there are enough similarities um, uh, to indicate that uh, these then uh, are uh, descended uh, from ancestors which used ribosomes to translate messenger RNAs to make uh, uh, proteins and all living things and have modified uh, the ancestral uh, structures. Now, um, one of the fascinating things about ribosomes is that it is a mix of RNA and protein. And it is thought that this is inherited from the world where the transition between RNA and protein was occurring. RNA actually does the most important job in the ribosome. It is RNA that serves as the enzyme which joins amino acids in a peptide bond. But the proteins help to maintain its shape and to regulate it. And so this is what we think is a model for those ancestors of cells, that RNA was doing stuff, these big complicated molecules of RNA, but that the early proteins were small structures which helped the RNA maintain its shape and helped to make its, uh, its uh, function optimal. It was only later that then proteins then became more elaborate and became the primary doers of uh, the cell uh, and that uh, RNA uh, no longer had that primary uh, role. And so um, the fact that ribosomes are made of big complicated molecules of RNA, one of which serves as a ribozyme, and that there are lots of uh, proteins which uh, help uh, regulate it and modify its shape. Um, this seems to be a, you know, a feature of those ancestral cells making the transition out of the RNA world. And there seems to be more of uh, these uh, relics of that transition as well. So if we think of our DNA as a genome, and if this, say all of these hundred DNA molecules represents the genome of humans, um, well, not all of that gets converted into RNA. So the RNA uh, portion of this is the transcriptome. So you know, between half and 70% of this genome gets converted into RNA. Um, but only about 3% of that genome ends up then coding for protein, making what's called a proteome, all right? And so um, if you ask, well, if only 3% of the genome codes for protein, what does all of this other RNA do? Well, that's one of the, the things that we're learning in the modern world, um, that RNA has far more functions than uh, we once and thought that it did. So there are RNAs which serve as transfer RNAs, ribosomal RNAs, but then there are, are also small nuclear RNAs um, which do splicing as I'll get to. There are small nucleolar uh, RNAs, there are micro RNAs, there are all sorts of RNAs uh, which have important roles in the cell, but these RNAs are never converted into uh, protein. So it's still RNA with uh, a, a terminal uh, function. What did the first genes look like? Well, we think that they were a lot smaller and they would have had to have been uh, uh, joined um, uh, uh, to have uh, a function as part of larger uh, complexes. Now today, that's typical of eukaryotic genes because eukaryotic genes have introns, but the type of introns which eukaryotes have they are not present in prokaryotes. And, and so, you know, as we ask what the genes look like, you know, that brings it to the structure of introns. Well, there are these things called group one introns that are present in bacteria and primitive eukaryotes. Um, they are fascinating because they actually cut themselves out of uh, the genome. So this is once again, an RNA molecule um, that can perform, you know, a catalytic uh, function. Uh, so, you know, perhaps a throwback to the RNA, um, uh, an RNA world. So that's uh, exciting. Um, interestingly, uh, it is known in bacteria primarily, but since, as I'll be mentioning, it seems that mitochondria and chloroplasts are the descendants of bacteria, the presence of group one introns, not only in bacteria, 
but in mitochondria and chloroplasts, which seem to be the descendants of bacteria, that's, uh, that's exciting. Okay. Now there's a slightly more uh, complex version of, uh, of introns known as group two introns, which, which can actually move about a bit. They actually code for a, um, uh, a, uh, a protein which can help uh, move them. Uh, once again, um, uh, these are things that can be associated, associated with mitochondria uh, or chloroplasts or um, that the genes from them have now migrated to the nucleus of the eukaryotes from these group two introns. So there are remnants of these, um, but it seems that from then group two introns comes then the type of intron uh, which typifies then the eukaryotes. These introns, which are called spliceosomal introns, are exciting because one, spliceosomes, which edit the eukaryotic genome, then involve uh, both RNA and protein, just like the ribosome did. So when we make spliceosomes to edit meaning in our uh, genome, we use lots of little uh, RNAs, these small nuclear RNAs, these SN RNAs, which are never converted uh, to protein. But then there's lots of little proteins which then uh, coalesce with them. And so once again, this you know, is how we think the cellular world began as uh, uh, functional RNAs we're now associating with small uh, proteins uh, to do functions. And so the spliceosomes, which cut out spliceosomal introns um, and edit uh, the genome, uh, we think uh, comes uh, uh, from uh, this. And the idea that little pieces of disparate you know, genetic information can then be joined to make larger genes that make larger molecules. Also, we think that's a throwback to uh, earlier uh, uh, genes where the first genes would have been smaller and code for uh, subunits of things which then uh, were fully functional as larger uh, as larger conglomerate uh, structures. Sorry. So a lot of geneticists are currently studying all of the RNAs that we didn't really appreciate. Um, we once again, you know, uh, primarily looked at RNA as being an intermediary um, between uh, the DNA method of the code and uh, proteins. Um, but now there's all of these other types of RNAs. Now, because they're so small, you know, it was harder to find, uh, to find them or to know what to search for uh, originally, and that's an active area of, uh, of research. Once again, you know, perhaps this you know, was at least in part inspired by, you know, the question about earlier cells, but it turns out these are incredibly important in the regulation of human uh, diseases, um, in uh, biotechnology, and so, you know, this has led to this uh, great understanding of uh, life, you know, uh, uh, far more uh, advanced than what we had had um, uh, primitively. Okay. So, as we compare living things, one of the things that strikes us is that even though bacteria and humans are so vastly different, that we share stuff. Not only the uh, mechanics of uh, much of DNA replication, transcription, translation, um, but then also so many other uh, so many other genes. So for example, I digest food with serine proteases, um, but bacteria have serine uh, proteases. I carry oxygen with globins, but bacteria have uh, uh, globins. We could go on and on where many of the genes which we find in humans are actually modified versions of genes that we find in bacteria. And so therefore we think that LUCA the last universal common ancestor, not only had DNA, RNA, and, and, and protein, but had a number of uh, features which are now shared among all living things, having existed in the first uh, living things, including transcription factors, even though eukaryotes will make far more advanced use of things like transcription factors, the first transcription factors then originate in um, 
in a bacteria. Now, we can test this by looking for, say, the presence of genes, you know, bacteria have serine proteases, so do I, bacteria have G protein coupled receptors, so do I, bacteria have kinases, so do I. Uh, but then we could also take um, homologous genes and then compare their sequences. So, for example, if you say, oh, you know, there are ribosomal RNAs in bacteria and in eukaryotes and in all living things, let's share the, uh, uh, let's compare the sequences. And then what we see is that they seem to be related. So there seems to be a family tree of life, whether we're looking at the presence of genes, whether we're, we're looking at um, uh, sequences. All living things uh, appear to then have uh, modified uh, versions of, uh, you know, uh, ancestral uh, genes. And the great tree of life gets split into uh, eubacteria, uh, that's a primitive form of bacteria, archaea, a different group of archaea. So, you know, bacteria seem to form these two big groups, the eubacteria and the archaea, and then the eukaryotes, which would include animals, uh, plants, and, uh, and fungi. And so a lot of geneticists then uh, end up studying the uh, relationships uh, between groups of living things as indicated by the presence of genes and sequences. Now, this then involves the passage of time. So a quick aside into that, because you know, some people, you know, when they study prokaryotes, are actually studying their fossils. There is a period of life uh, of Earth's history where no life is known. All right, so from the formation of the, the planet 4.6 billion years ago to maybe 3.5 billion years ago, um, there seems to be no life on Earth. Now, we could argue that while there are no fossils of cells, that there could be traces of chemicals indicative that life was indeed present a bit earlier than 3.5 billion years ago, say going back to say 3.8 uh, billion years ago. Um, but that would be another conversation. From the period of about 3.5 billion years ago uh, uh, to about 2 billion years ago, the planet does have life, but the only living things uh, are prokaryotes. The simplest living things alive today are bacteria, the eubacteria and the archaea. And they are the only living things for about a third of life's history. Things like animals don't appear until late in Earth's uh, history and vertebrates, you know, and, and vertebrates on land much later than that. And so a lot of um, geneticists hoping to piece together what early life was like, then study, you know, bacteria and compare them because they were the only form of life on Earth for a third of its uh, history um, here from, say, 3.5 billion years ago or earlier uh, to 2 uh, billion uh, years uh, ago. Now, uh, the, uh, while, you know, we often try to summarize you know, bacteria, just to make it easier to, uh, you know, to think about them. Say, oh, they're small, they're about a micron, they have a circular chromosome. It should be stressed that, you know, bacteria vary a great deal, um, you know, and they did have, you know, a billion and a half years where only they existed on the planet to vary. And so some bacteria are actually bigger uh, than small eukaryotic cells. Some can actually even be seen without a microscope. Um, that while bacteria can have a circular micro, uh, chromosome, they can have multiple chromosomes, they can have linear chromosomes. Um, some of the largest bacteria can have thousands of chromosomes. Uh, they can have this extra chromosomal DNA known as plasmids. Uh, and so when studying the genome of you know, bacteria, it should be stressed that there's enormous uh, variety uh, here. We shouldn't you know, be lulled into thinking that all of the bacteria are uh, the same. And there are enormous distinctions between what we call the eubacteria and the archaea. So bacteria do not fall into one group. We think that, you know, from the outset, uh, early in life's history, there were then two groups, uh, which then uh, give us the two groups of life we find today. Many of the archaea, but then also many of the, of the eubacteria, they um, exist in very extreme environments, like very high temperatures, uh, very high uh, pressures, uh, et cetera. Um, 
and so uh, there's uh, you know great diversity and because not only are there you bacteria that live in very extreme environments like high temperatures high acid high pressures um, and many of the archaea it's uh, the same um, it is then uh, plausible that that's how life began that because many of the most basal branches on the tree of life Right, so when we look at you know the various groups of living things, the roots of these branches closest to the base um, are uh, hyperthermophiles, lineages of archaea and eubacteria, uh, which thrive at very high temperatures. Uh, it seems uh, likely then that in the primitive Earth, where uh, we think that uh, uh, the conditions were very hostile. Uh, with you know very high temperatures and high acid levels, et cetera, that these lineages of hyperthermophile bacteria they date back uh, to the primitive Earth, which then had you know uh, you know very extreme conditions by modern standards. It should be remembered that so much of life on Earth is life that we don't sample directly. All right, the deep underneath uh, the ocean. Um, that uh, uh, in a rock uh, deep underneath the Earth's crust, there is life, all right? So as far down as we have been able to uh, seek, there are living things forming what we call the deep biosphere. Um, and so uh, therefore, uh, uh, it's not necessarily irrelevant that, you know, uh, there are so many bacteria which thrive at high temperatures. Uh, that was not only probable probably the conditions of early Earth, but it's thought that perhaps half of all microbes on Earth live in this deep biosphere, deep underneath the, uh, uh, the ocean uh, bottom um, and um, deep underneath the Earth's uh, crust, right? And so um, when you look at how much animals weigh, if you were to take all of the animals on Earth and weigh them, they would weigh about this much. But then if you weigh all of the archaea and all of the U bacteria, it far exceeds that, all right? And, and it's thought that about half of these bacteria, that would be maybe a third of the living things on Earth, um, they then uh, are in this deep biosphere. And so if you, we want to understand life on Earth, how life started, you know, we're not really sampling those um, those organisms and so that may be an area where we need to focus in future research. Now of all of the bacteria, um, one very significant group forms a kingdom of eubacteria called the cyanobacteria. Now we often call them blue-green algae, all right, but they are actually uh, a kind of bacteria and arguably one then of uh, the most uh, significant they perform photosynthesis. Now, many bacteria do, but they do it differently. They use chlorophyll, and they use sunlight to make carbon dioxide and water into glucose um, and release oxygen gas as a waste. There are different forms of bacterial photosynthesis. Not all bacterial photosynthesis does that. Um, and so the type of photosynthesis that you studied you know, in your past associated with plants um, is what cyanobacteria uh, perform. Um, now, uh, they are uh, significant because if we were to then put Earth's history in two halves, all right, um, so if you consider the history of our planet, for half of the history of our planet, there really wasn't much oxygen in the air, all right, and then for the later half, there was. Well, what happened here all right, that changed that world so that our planet went from being one where there wasn't much oxygen to where there was. Well, that's when these cyanobacteria appear in the fossil record. So it seems that our planet was changed by these bacteria and the photosynthesis that they performed, which then released oxygen in the air. And it was in the aftermath of the cyanobacteria putting oxygen into the atmosphere, that we get a brand new type of cell, uh, the eukaryotic cell, appears right after the cyanobacteria start adding oxygen. Now, in addition to plants, fungi, and animals being made of eukaryotic cell, there are lots of protists like um, 
amoeba, paramecia, various forms of algae made of eukaryotic cells. So that was a new type of a cell which evolved and appeared in the fossil record by two billion years ago. So uh, when geneticists ask you know, questions about early life, studying eukaryotes gives us insight into um, you know, this new lineage which appeared two uh, billion years ago. Now, where could eukaryotes come from? Well, eukaryotes tend to be larger, more complex cells with membrane-bound organelles. So they wrap their uh, DNA with a membrane. Now, some bacteria actually do that as well. And so perhaps that was a trait inherited from bacteria. But others have posed other ideas, including, you know, maybe a, you know, a virus infecting other uh, uh, cells, uh, such as an archaean, um, would then lead to the wrapping of a, uh, a DNA message here, but with translation occurring in uh, the cytoplasm. And so, um, we're not quite sure which of uh, several possible models might account uh, for the origin of the nucleus. Um, but one thing which is strongly supported is that mitochondria and chloroplasts seem to come from endosymbionts of bacteria which learned to live inside larger cells. Now, usually, when one cell eats another, it's um, then uh, for the process of digestion. Um, sometimes smaller cells inside larger cells can be parasites which take advantage of the host cell. But we also know that a possibility in our modern world is that both cells benefit from their reaction, that some cells then live inside others as endosymbionts in a symbiotic relationship where both uh, benefit. Now, we can see this happening uh, today. Corals, for example, are animals that have endosymbionts. There are even endosymbiotic uh, algae which can live uh, inside uh, a spotted salamander, a vertebrate, and then numerous invertebrates. But what we think happened at the dawn of eukaryote history is that um, bacteria adapted to live inside um, larger uh, cells, probably an archaean, uh, which uh, then gave rise to cells living inside other cells where they both benefit. And the reason, or the reasons which uh, we feel this is supported is because mitochondria and chloroplasts have so many features then of, uh, of bacteria, not of uh, the uh, nucleus and its DNA. So for example, mitochondria and chloroplasts, they are the size and shape of bacteria. And we know of free living bacteria, which seem to be their relatives. So there are proteobacteria, which seem to be related to mitochondria. And chloroplasts seem to be then related to cyanobacteria. Um, a cell can't make new mitochondria or chloroplasts. They have to divide by fission, the way that bacteria typically uh, divide. Both mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own chromosomes. So humans actually have 47 chromosomes, 46 in the nucleus, and a different kind in their mitochondria, and one in each mitochondria. So if a cell has thousands of mitochondria, that means there are thousands of additional chromosomes in addition to the 46 nuclear chromosomes. Um, there are genomic similarities between the mitochondrial DNA or the chloroplast DNA and bacterial DNA, the codon usage, how translation is initiated, et cetera. The antibiotics uh, which affect bacteria then also affect mitochondria and uh, chloroplasts. There can be plasmids in mitochondria and lots of other uh, things which link uh, mitochondria um, and cyanobacteria to bacteria which learn to live inside other organisms and gradually adapt over time. So that's where we think the mitochondria uh, came from and thus the eukaryotic cell. And many geneticists, you know, consider mitochondria. I mean, mitochondria are important in cells. They do lots of different functions from digesting food to preventing cancer. Um, um, but uh, many geneticists are interested in this mitochondrial uh, 
uh, chromosome, which is once again inherited uh, a relic of the bacteria. So here's uh, the cells of a turtle's liver. In addition to the nucleus here, you can see all of these little dots are the mitochondria. While the mitochondrial DNA is small, um, nevertheless, look at the great number of mitochondria which can exist in cells. This certainly adds up. And there are certainly human uh, disorders, um, genetic disorders, and then even you know, some cases of cancer, which are caused by changes in the mitochondrial um, uh, genome rather than uh, the uh, nuclear uh, genome. And so um, the uh, earliest eukaryotes arose from endosymbiotic events, which gave rise to mitochondria, chloroplast in some, uh, which would ultimately then lead to uh, green algae and plants. And then in you know, protists, there are other uh, cases of endosymbiosis as well and some other groups of algae. Eukaryotes all share features which um, are lacking in bacteria. So those earliest eukaryotes two billion years ago, they had lots of new genes. Um, which you know affected their membranes, their cytoskeletons, as you can see in this moving amoeba, but then just in the, how they regulate uh, their genes, their enzymes, the type of cilia and flagella being uh, different uh, from the types of flagella we see in new bacteria and archaea. And so um, as we look at uh, living uh, things, it, living things have evolved over a series of uh, events and uh, the earliest eukaryotes then give us insights into you know, the genetic similarities that all uh, eukaryotes uh, share. And this seems to have occurred over uh, time. And so that uh, in the great family tree of uh, uh, eukaryotes, uh, which you know, we are still arguing uh, over, um, some lineages such as that of Giardia seem to be more basal. And so that if uh, we want to get an idea of uh, how um, the first eukaryotes are, uh, Giardia, which doesn't have mitochondria, although seemingly the relative of the endosymbion um, prior to it uh, developing into a mitochondria. Giardia, which don't have sexual reproduction, but which have some of the genes for sexual reproduction, uh, which, uh, and then other features, uh, Giardia perhaps uh, represents a basal, um, a basal uh, uh, eukaryote. Other eukaryotic lineages then evolved over uh, time, um, and so uh, fungi are related to some protists. Uh, plants evolved from green algae um, that had cyanobacteria living inside them doing photosynthesis, uh, and then allowed them to adapt, adapt to land, uh, and then um, animals evolved from protists uh, such as the uh, coanoflagellates, uh, which are the closest relatives of animals as shown by a number of things, um, such as uh, shared genes, such as receptor tyrosine kinases, which are very important in uh, animals, but are also uh, known in uh, these um, uh, coanoflagellates. Now, a lot of geneticists then then study how genomes evolve and how specific lineages evolve. And very often this, you know, uh, involves studying the duplication of genes and then how the modified duplicates were then uh, changed into a gene family, such as in humans, the hundreds of kinases in the kinase gene family, the thousand of G-protein coupled receptors in the G-protein coupled receptor family having uh, evolved from modified duplicates of ancestral uh, genes. Um, uh, there then can uh, uh, be studies of how, you know, uh, things which were originally uh, small uh, uh, genes um, could then, through genetic recombination, chromosomal breakages, etc., cetera, uh, then be uh, uh, resulting in uh, genes which are multi-domain uh, uh, genes. Um, so there are certainly many other directions uh, which one uh, can, uh, can go. Um, but I just wanted to kind of give a quick introduction because as geneticists study uh, genes, in addition to helping us understand 
modern living things, very often um, uh, this actually throws light on what would have happened early in Earth's history with early eukaryotes, early living cells, or, or you know, perhaps even going back to the ancestors of cells, and certainly different models of how those early events have uh, happened um, have helped us understand um, uh, 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 living things. And so, you know, something as, you know, distant as, you know, uh, pursuing possible uh, hypotheses on how uh, life arose leads to discoveries which then helps us, you know, understand and treat human cancer or has applications in biotechnology uh, simply because it helps to, you know, understand life in general. And so, uh, many geneticists uh, study, you know, the origin of life and early life. But once again, you know, these principles, you know, then unify uh, many of, of, you know, the ideas in uh, genetics. And so I wanted to give an overview of them here.